Hi there. This is once again, Unstoppable Mindset. I'm Mike Hinkson, your host. Glad that you're here with us wherever you happen to be or wherever you're driving or however you're listening to our podcast. And I want to thank you again for being here with us. Today, we get to meet Homera Fagihi. Homera is a licensed psychotherapist. She has a PhD in psychology, right? Um, doctorate, yes. Doctorate, doctorate. yeah, PhD, yes, a doctorate in psychology. So she's uh, she's got lots to tell us. And she helps, especially women, dealing with overcoming challenges, which is, of course, for our purposes, another way of talking about being unstoppable and helping people become more unstoppable than they think they can be, which is what we're all about. So we get to have a, a chat, and I'm sure it's going to be kind of fun. So Himera, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you. I am so happy to be here, Michael. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, especially kind of your early life and so on. Um, it's always a fun place to start. I think Lewis Carroll always talked about starting at the beginning. So why don't we do that and go from there? Yes. Um, I was born and raised in Iran. And um, I experienced the revolution during my preteen years. and. Uh, half of the Iran-Iraq war, I was in Iran. So I, in addition to my own personal life difficulties, then we had this collective trauma that we were all going through in Iran. Um, and at the age of 19, I left and I came to the US uh, by myself. And I have been living here in Los Angeles since then. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how quick you want me to move forward but <laughs> well let's let's yes. do this um so what got you interested in moving to the u.s of all places certainly that's a major culture shock from living in iran and of course yes. with all of the things going on with the revolution and so on they would yeah. consider us the big enemy and and all that yeah. so what made you want to come to the u.s Yes, as a child, um, before the revolution, of course, I was very aware that many, many Americans lived in Iran, and we had American TV and American radio. And so I was always fascinated, I would always listen to the American radio in Iran. And I even though I didn't understand what they were saying, I just, you know, at least enjoyed the music. And I would watch the TV shows again, not understanding what was happening, but enjoyed it very much. And also, I had family members who lived in the US. So I always had this fascination with America. And so that translated into you deciding to move. That was a still a big step. Yes, very much so, especially at that time, after the revolution, with all the friction between the two countries, it was not easy to get here. It was um, very, very difficult to get here, but I made it. <laughs> How did you get a visa? How were you able to, to come to the U.S.? I mean, you had to be pretty committed and had to obviously go through all sorts of steps to make that happen. I'd love to hear yes. the story. Yes, um, I would love to tell the story. Um, as a kid, as a teenager, obviously, I didn't know anything about creative visualization or these manifestation tools that everybody, strategies that everybody knows these days and talk, talk about. But I um, knew in my soul that I would be living in the US at some point. I just knew that. And so the whole process was a mir one miracle after another. Um, basically, I, because there was no embassy in Iran, I had to go to another country to go to the US embassy there and get my student visa from there. And I have an uncle who lives in London. So the plan was for me to go to London and then apply to the US from there. And the fact that I got visa to England, to, to the UK, that was a miracle on its own. Because that day when I was when I went to apply for my visa, they did not give visa to any young people except for me. I mean, it was again a, a true, true miracle that I was the only person of all the young people there who got the UK visa that day. Then um, 
I applied when I was in London. I applied to the for the U.S. Um, visa twice, and both times they just looked at my documents. They didn't really look at them. They didn't. I don't remember if they gave me any good reason. They just put the denied stamp on my passport, which was devastating. It was devastating. I can't even express describe the feeling that you get that uh, that that you have that happen to you twice. So the decision after then was either to go back to Iran or try one more time. And I didn't know what to do. And uh, one of my uh, uncle's friends came over, just happened to come over. And I told her my story. And she said, you talk about the U.S. with such passion. I wonder if you wrote that in a letter and just took it to the next interview. Maybe somebody will read your letter. And I said, you know, I'm desperate. I do whatever, but I don't. And my English is not good enough for me to write such a letter. So she said, you just tell me and I write it. So I told her in Farsi. She wrote the letter in English. And before the third um, uh, appointment that I had with them, I went the day before and I gave the letter to the guard and asked him if he could please give it to whoever's in charge there. And the next day when I went in for my interview, the shocking thing that happened the moment I walked in, because normally the other two times, <clears throat> excuse me, the other two times they would have, they would basically take your name, then you would have a seat. And then there are these windows that they would assign to you, and you would go to a window and talk to an officer in the window. But when I got in this time, they just said to me, come, come on around the back. So they took me to the back office, which was really shocking and confusing to me. Why would you take me there? And a gentleman who I believe was a top person there, he came and saw me back there and he only asked one question. He did not even look at my um, documents. He just said, um, did you write this letter yourself? And I said, um, well, these are my words in Farsi translated into English. So yes and no. And I explained to him how my English was not good enough to do a letter like that. And he just said, wait right here. He went to another office and came back with my visa without even looking at my documents. And at the time, this is truly miraculous because at the time, I don't know how things are right now, but it, you would need three weeks before they responded to your application. And But he gave me the visa right there and then. And um, it was one of the best moments of my life, dream coming true. <laughs> that must have been really exciting to have that happen. You know, we're over here so used to paperwork, so used to bureaucracies. But I also know that oftentimes the way to cut through a lot of bureaucracies is to get to the right person to say the right thing and to get people to really understand where your heart is. Yes. If you can make that happen, a lot yeah. of doors can open. And all of those things align that day. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I, he was definitely the top person there. So he could decide that we don't have to wait three weeks for for you to get the visa here. I'm giving it to you. <laughs> so well, that was, you know, you you waited already and it had been denied. So, you know, yes. that's a way to justify it, too. Yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> so you came to the U.S. and your English wasn't really very good, as you say. How did you deal with that? Because you clearly speak quite well now. Thank you. I do try. But uh, yes, at the time, you know, because I had uh, studied English um, through all through my 12 years of school. So I, I knew grammar a little bit. Um, somewhat, I would say I was somewhat good at grammar, but I couldn't speak and I couldn't understand what people were saying. And so those were the skills that I needed to work on. And so for the um, speaking ability, the best thing that I did was I started to work right away. And so when, you ha when you're forced to speak, you, you learn. You, ha you have no other way but to speak. And, and so that was really helpful. And also, of course, going to um, English school, English as second language school, as well as mm -hmm. Um, in Santa Monica College, I took a um, an English course. So those, of course, helped too. But I think the 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 one that helped the most was, um, and this may be funny to some, but it was really a, a lifesaver for me at the time. They had Three's Company and Family Ties back to back on TV, and ah. I watched those two shows every night, and uh, they were very very helpful. 
And um, also, just to let you know how poor my English was, my first movie here in the US was The Breakfast Club. And for those who have seen it, The Breakfast Club is a story of five kids sitting in a library on a Saturday in detention and speaking. And there, so there's no action. There's no story to follow. Right. There's five kids talking. And it was terrible, terrible experience for me because I did not understand anything. And I felt so out of place because uh, I felt so like out of place. I felt that I was out of place because everybody was laughing at every single line and I wasn't getting what was happening. So my first job was at a video store. What I did was I would, I would uh, watch this video of the breakfast club over and over and over and over again. And every time I learned you know, one line, it was a victory and motivation to watch it again, to learn more. And so it's a very special movie to me. And, Aside and from the so, fact that it's a really good movie once I got it. <laughs> well, there is that. Yes. And, and of course you watch Family Ties. So Michael J. Fox taught you English. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and Jack Trooper. <laughs> and Jack Trooper, right. And, yes. and all the people on Three's Company. What a, yes. what a collection of people to teach you English. Have you ever had a chance to tell any of them what a good job they did? No, unfortunately, I did not. I did not. However, a movie that later on affected me in a different way, which was the, um, I don't know if you've seen Goodwill Hunting, but that was yes. a very special movie. And I was able to communicate that with Ben Affleck, not Matt Damon, but Ben Affleck. And I, it's a long story. But anyway, I was able to do that and got a signed um, script from him. And a CD or yeah, the CD of the, no, not the CD, but the DVD. Of the, the DVD. Movie. Yes. I thought it was a soundtrack, but I about bought the soundtrack myself. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. Well, you did get to, to tell him and that's, that's yes. a good thing. Yes. It's, it's, it's kind of an odd compliment to get from someone because I'm sure most, most of the time they want to hear and they do get to hear what a great movie it was or the critics say what a bad movie it was in here. You taught me English. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I never, I never really wrote to, I believe, was it, was it John Kelly? Uh, I, I don't know, the, the creator of The Breakfast Club, I forget his name. He did a bunch of good movies. I don't, I forget his name, unfortunately. Uh-huh. Yeah, but anyway. So yeah, you, I didn't write to him. So you got to the U.S., you went to college, and you studied. Yes, I had that on pause for a while because of financial issues. I was on yeah. my own and I wasn't able to manage um, all the costs. So I had to put that on hold to work full time and two jobs. Many, many years I worked two jobs. So yes, but eventually I, I was able to go back to school. Yes. So you, but you, but you did get back to it and yes. you ended up getting a doctorate and that's pretty good. Yes. Yes. So I got my bachelor's in psychology, master's in social work. Then I became licensed as a clinical social worker here in the state of California. And when I went back to school, I got my doctorate. And, and thank you for reminding me. I wanted to say um, I did not get a PhD. I got a PsyD, which is a psychology doctorate. And the mm. difference between PsyD and PhD is that PhD is very research focused right. and PsyD is clinical focused. And, and I so stand I got, corrected. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Thank you. But I just for because if you're not in the field, for those who are not in the field, uh, they probably most people don't know the difference between the two, but there is a difference. But you got a PsyD in, in yes. psychology. So you didn't, yes. you didn't get an actual medical degree in no, psychiatry, no. you stayed no, in psychology. No. But, but that's pretty important. And, and it's a good thing that you did. Well, yes. you, you certainly have taken a number of risks and are, are a risk taker in a lot of ways. And I want to come back to that in a little bit, but you went to work. That, so what did you do when you, you got your PsyD or what kind of work did you then go into? Yes. Yeah, so right after my master's um, is in social work is when I got my first professional job as a therapist. And I worked um, in your hometown of Palmdale for over 13 years in a community mental health clinic. I helped kids. Uh, many of them were in foster care. Um, and that's where I worked for 13 and a half years, I would say. And then after that, I worked at the VA for about nine years. And that was uh, last year when I resigned from the VA. Last year? Yes. And I had oh. private practice on the side for some time so, in the past. So which yeah. branch of the VA did you work at? 
So I was in the um, the, the main one here in the LA area, in ah, the greater okay. Los Angeles area is in West LA. I worked in the second biggest branch, which was in the Valley. That's where okay. I was in, in North Hills for about nine years. It seems to be also, isn't there a fairly substantial one in Long Beach? Yes, definitely. There's one in Long Beach uh, and uh, downtown LA. Yes, and then little offices in other places. I think like a lot Santa of the, I think Pardon a lot me? of the visual. I think a lot of the visual issues um, go through Long Beach. Are I, I yes. may be mistaken? But that's sort of what I remember. Yes, I think so too. Although we we did have a person who came to our branch, but I believe you're right. She came from Long Beach. I believe. Yeah. I could be wrong. So you now have your own private practice and. That I, I definitely want to to learn about. But as I said earlier, you were a risk taker. What's the bravest thing you've ever done in the United States? The bravest thing that I've ever done in my life uh, altogether is um, at the age of uh, 21, um, where I was already here for a year and I was living with a family member, but I was really interested in moving on uh, to uh, live with two friends that I met two girls I met in Santa Monica College and we became very good friends. And I really wanted to move in with them and live with them. And unfortunately, I didn't get any support around that. And not because my family didn't believe in me, but because they had never seen that done. And they kept reminding me that you have, uh, you don't have any money, you don't speak English very well yet. Um, how are you gonna do this? Uh, we are very much against you moving out because you're going to end up back in Iran. Is that what you want? And I said, absolutely not. I do not want to end up back in Iran. And so it was very brave, I think. And um, recently, in fact, I was thinking about the 21-year-old in me, and I was in awe of her courage um, because I said, I, this is what I'm doing. And I know in my heart that I will not go back to live in Iran. That's not my plan. And so with any without any financial support, any emotional support with no money, because, you know, I would just work paycheck to paycheck. I had no savings, no backup. Um, I just decided to be on my own. And um, here I am 30 some years later, still in Los Angeles and very happy. This is my home. Why did you decide to do that? I mean, we all talk about support systems and so on all the time. And clearly you were leaving a lot of your support system behind although they were still your friends, but you wanted to be on your own. Why did you want to do that? I think it was important to me at the time to live my life the way I wanted to live my life. I had this freedom idea in my head that I need to live my life my way. And uh, that was big to me, even at 21, which is really incredible when I think about it. But that was me. I, I needed my freedom and, and live life my way. Well, that's pretty important to be able to do. And, and the fact that you were mature enough and understood it and obviously thought it through yes, because you, you knew what your situation was and you've made yes. it work. Yes. Because at the time I, you know, this is, we're talking 30 some years ago. So a one bedroom apartment in West LA was $600. Mm -hmm. And I was already paying $200 helping out with the rent for $200. So my thinking was, I went to these two friends and I said, what if I lived with you and your rent will come down from 300 to 200. So you will benefit from this and I'm paying the same rent. So, but I live, I get to live with you because I enjoy being with you too. And, mm -hmm. and they thought it was a good idea because they were getting money sent to them from Iran and the dollar was very expensive. And today is like ridiculously expensive, but to them, they were helping out their parents by moving me in with them. So it was a win-win situation. We definitely did think it through. And that makes a lot of sense, clearly. Yes. yes. And that apartment right now is probably $2,000, but oh, that's another least. story. <laughs> Oh, at least. Yes. Our home we bought six years ago when we built this house. And I think with all that's happened, it's pretty much doubled in value in six years. Wow. Yeah, it's it's amazing what's going on. Yes. And um, and I hope it's it I I certainly don't mind the high property value, but at the same time, it makes a lot of unaffordability for a number of people oh, who may sure. have the dream of getting a home. 
we were very blessed yes yes do you still live in an apartment or do you own a home now or um when i was before i got married um i was single and i wanted to have my own place so i bought my own place a one bedroom it's a tiny little one bedroom um but i never gave it up i'm i'm renting it out and so I, I have it. I just, it just felt good. I have always been very independent. And I always thought, I, I, you know, I need to, instead of paying for rent, I need to buy my own place. So I worked extra in order to be able to afford it. I got a Saturday extra job on Saturday so that I could buy that place. And I still have it. But right now I live with my husband. So yes, we own our place. Oh, that's good. Well, the How bank you... owns it. <laughs> the well, bank yeah, owns the it. bank owns it. That's true. <laughs> yes. How long have you been married now? It's been 10 years now. And yeah. you guys put up with each other, huh? Well, we do put up with each other. And you know, when you <laughs> when you when you get married later in life, like the both of us did, it's it can get tricky, but at the same time, because we got married later in life, we both respect our need for privacy and yeah, like individual time. So we both get that and that it works. It works fine. <laughs> well, my wife and I got married. I was 32, she was 33. I love to say I taught her everything she knows, but uh, <laughs> you know we got married fairly later in life, and our position is we knew what we wanted, yes. and um, and you can know that earlier, but we really knew what we wanted, and yes. so we, when we got married, we were pretty sure it was going to be something that would work, and you know we have to communicate, and there are times that we get angry and. And we deal with it. And that's the biggest issue is you got to deal with whatever comes along. Exactly. Yes. Yes. It's all about communication. Very much so. Very much so. And I think the older we get, the more hopefully all of us are recognizing how important it is. Because, you know, in younger days, there's so so much of um, low self-esteem going on for myself. I know for many of my clients that we're not able to express ourselves. We just take everything most things and say yes to many things that we don't want to. And so, yeah. Well, so you worked in Palmdale for 13 years. And I don't know what the population of Palmdale was when you were there. But when I went off to UC Irvine in oh, a long time ago, 1968, Palmdale had a population of 2700 people. Now, oh. of course, it's huge. Yes. And, and Victorville, wasn't even a speck compared to Palmdale. And when we came down here to look for property to build a home, we decided to move down here in 2014 to be closer to family. And when we came down here to look for property to build a home, we were amazed that Victorville had over 115,000 people in the whole Victor Valley area was like close to 600,000 people. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. And how was it, if I may ask, how was it for you to move from Irvine to 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 Victorville? How, is that well? Different? It it a lot of moves in between. Oh, um, okay. So I went to UC Irvine, and then I was part of a research project developing the first reading machine that would read print out loud for blind people, developed by a guy named Ray Kurzweil. And so I moved across country on my own to be involved in that and then lived in Massachusetts until oh, yes. Yes. 1981 when yeah. the company I was working for, Kurzweil Computer Products, asked if I would go back out to California because Kurzweil was in the process of being acquired by Xerox and they wanted me to help integrate Kurzweil into the Xerox world. So we did and kind of it all went from there. But I've been on both coasts a couple of times. And then in 2002, I moved from New Jersey, having worked in the World Trade Center on September 11th, we moved to the Bay Area, because I had an opportunity to work at Guide Dogs for the Blind, where all of my dogs have been from. And also people were asking me to come and speak and tell our story. But then in 2014, we decided to move down here, circumstances made that happen. So I never thought I'd be living close to Palmdale again. Yes, you ended up here. And I, and I, and I knew this, uh, I'm sorry that I had forgotten. But yes, I, I knew that you had moved between the two coasts, uh, back and forth. Yes. Well, well, how did you end up um, after working in Palmdale for 13 and, and a half years or so? What made you go to the VA and, and leave what you were doing? Was it 
just the job thing or how did that happen? Yes, I really, really enjoyed my work, work in Palmdale. It was very rewarding and I loved it very much. There came a point when I, I was ready to do um, something different, maybe, and you know, I got to that point. And this is when um, actually before I even came to this realization, I let me go back here. Before I came to that realization that I need to do something else, I actually had this client and usually my clients were teens. Um, but for some reason, I ended up, um, again, you know, universe does put things in order and aligns things sometimes. But I had this uh, uh, first grader that I was helping and he always came in with his grandfather, um, which the grandfather was also his adoptive father. And he was a Vietnam War veteran. And I ended up working with him individually uh, because his anxiety was affecting the kid's anxiety. So we did a lot of work together with the father. And I was so honored every time he told me, you know, you have helped me much more than the VA. And I was like, how is that possible? I'm not even your therapist. I'm your kid's therapist. But um, he kept saying that. And so I was very honored by that. And also I was, my work with him was very, um, I was very touched by him because he was just such a beautiful soul. What a, it was, he was just such a beautiful person. And to know that this beautiful soul had experienced the type of traumas that he had experienced, it, I, it just um, shook me and inspired me and affected me in all sorts of ways. I thought, okay, I'm interested in working maybe with more veterans. So at the time I was in private practice and um, on the side. And so I signed up with the, uh, with the Soldiers Project, which is a group of therapists who donate their time to help veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan to, for, for whatever reason, if they're not able or willing to go to the VA, then they would come to us for therapy. So I helped another veteran in private practice that way. And then I thought, okay, I think I, I like working with veterans so much that I'm gonna apply to the VA. And so this position came up for a women's health social worker at the VA here in the Valley. And uh, it was the very first job that I applied to. Um, I didn't think that I would get it because at the time I noticed everybody who, who found a new job, they went on interview after interview after interview. So I didn't think that I would get this job. I just applied. And again, another miracle, I believe, I ended up getting the job and I was super, super happy about that. Shocked and happy that my first interview led to an actual, you know, to a job. And I enjoyed my, my time there very much. I, I was part of the history there because I was the very first women's health social worker on that campus. Before me, that position did not exist. So I'm, I'm very honored to have been the very first one. And I enjoyed my time there very much. I always told my supervisor, every time she said there's another opening you know, for a higher position, I never applied because I thought I wanna do what I enjoy. And this is, I have the best social work job on this campus. I always told her that and I meant it and I enjoyed it very much. So I was there for about nine years until last year. So you worked at the LA campus and so you, you helped a lot of women and men, or did you mainly concentrate on women at the VA? Yes, my, my title was women's health social worker. So I was in primary care women's clinic. And the only time I get to, I got to help uh, men veterans was when I was covering for other social workers. If they were on vacation or sick day or, um, you know, not, not there, then I would cover for them. So those were the times that, that I, that I helped men veterans or, and we had also a lot of um, transgender or not, I shouldn't say a lot, but we did have some uh, transgender clients in women's clinic as well. So kind of an interesting question out of curiosity more than anything. Obviously there are differences between men and women, at least uh, I've heard that in the past, but um, I say that sarcastically, but, but, but in reality are a lot of the challenges that the women veterans face similar to the ones that you had to deal with or that others dealt with with men or are the problems really so different that it's hard to compare the two? There, there are definitely some similarities and there are some differences. And that's mm -hmm. why we had a women's clinic there. And that's why they, they decided, and good for me, and I believe for the veterans, for them to have a women's health social worker. Um, the, the differences, I mean, we know about the similarities in terms of, you know, some, you know, difficulties during their service, anything from 
moving away from family or adjusting to the military culture, adjusting back to the civilian life, um, you know, or difficulty with mental health issues, physical health issues that come up during service. I mean, they would have those things in common, of course. Uh, but in terms of what's different, uh, one thing that is different is that the rate of military sexual trauma among women is higher than in men. So many of my, my clients had experienced military sexual trauma. And of course, men experience it too, but, but less often. And the other uh, thing that I would say is different for women is that um, because they came into the military uh, service um, life a little later on, although the population is growing, but they experienced a lot of um, uh, discrimination by men. Mm -hmm. And that's something just for being a woman in the military. Um, so that came up quite a bit among my clients that they weren't taken seriously because they were female. Mm -hmm. And so in those ways, their struggles were different. And of course, you know, with military sexual trauma leads to a lot of other problems such as um, uh, drug use issues or homelessness difficulty relating to other people, to their own children, or to even have a children, to have a family. So it's really complicated. And um, yeah, it's, it's a huge problem in my experience with women veterans. Of course, so, you know, I'm sorry, just to be clear, the, the veterans who are probably not coming to the VA, I'm going to guess many of them do not maybe face these issues, or maybe it's not as common for veterans who are not coming to the VA. So I'm speaking from a perspective of a social worker at the VA. I'm not speaking for all the veterans, of course. Sure. So what mainly did you do in, in your work? How did you proceed? Yes. Uh, so being that I was the very first one, I kind of was able to uh, make it my own, you know, kind of a work because I was the very first one. Of course, I had the, the main role, which was uh, to link veterans to resources. That was supposed to be my main job, to link them to resources at the VA or in the community. And um, I was told, and the reason I, I, you know, I really liked this job because it was a combination of case management and mental health. And so I knew that I would be doing some mental health. I started to see some veterans individually in therapy. And, and also what I learned that I really enjoyed doing groups. So even though nobody was really telling me to do these groups, I just saw the need for the groups and I kept developing new groups and offered those. And that became the most, I well, for the most part, very, very rewarding uh, part of my job. And I was really attached to these groups that I was running because they were so rewarding, especially, you know, for intimate partner violence, because a lot of women uh, struggle in silence with domestic violence, intimate partner violence. And so to offer help in a group setting, it would really help um, decrease the, the stigma around it. And, and it was very empowering and, and for them and rewarding for me. And of course, the real issue is that what you did was to get people to talk. Yes. And yes. to really deal with their issues. And as we know, one of the most powerful ways to do that is to talk about it. Yes, definitely. There's so much shame that, you know, we all experience shame, all of us. And I, and I always remind everyone of that. We all experience shame and, and we all think that we're pretty much the only one, except so when you, when you know that everybody experiences shame, everybody experiences self-judgment, especially with this particular subject, and you have conversations about it in a group setting, it can be so healing to know that you're not alone. So not only you're talking about it, but you're also talking about it with like five, six other women. Who, of course, as it turns out, all have at least similar, if not the same problems you do, yes. whoever you happen to be. Yes, very similar experiences. I mean, the details may be different, but the feelings that they cause, the self-doubt that they cause, um, the trauma response that they cause are very, very similar. So it's empowering when you discover you're not really alone after all. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And to learn tools, you know, how to, how to um, address these beliefs that you, you know, one has learned about themselves and their lies, you know, they're not the truth about the self. How do you teach the tools? 
Well, um, I have always been as a therapist, a big fan of cognitive behavior therapy. So a lot of what I taught my clients, whether in this particular group or other groups came from um, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy model and the triangle, the thought mood behavior triangle and how these three elements interact with each other. And so based on this triangle is where I taught a lot of um, tools to my clients then and now also, even though I don't do therapy right now, I do coaching, but I, but I use the same foundation for everything that I teach. So when did you start your own private practice? I gathered that that was going on somewhat while you were working at the VA? Yes. So the private practice that I had was, no, actually I stopped it when I, when I went to the VA, I had my private practice when I was working in Palmdale. Um, I was seeing um, women and children also adolescents, adolescents, teenagers in my, in my private practice um, as a therapist. But then when I started my work at the VA, it was so overwhelming at first that I couldn't do the private practice on the side. So I just Mm. closed my private practice. And then after I resigned from the VA last year, I um, created this um, online coaching service called Power to the Self. And so here at Power to the Self, I coach women um, to help transform their self-doubt into self-worth after leaving an unhealthy relationship. And most of my services, I, I'd like to do a, most of it in group format because of everything that I just explained. It's it's much more powerful. And my clients right now, they don't necessarily have to have come from a um, abusive background, as long as it was an, an unhealthy relationship and unhealthy enough to have affected their self-esteem, they're um, a good fit for the program that I've created. So why did you resign from the VA to start this again or what? A um, couple of reasons. One, well, I would say the main one is a lot of policies changed nationally mm. and also locally. Uh, they restructured things and, and they, the way they restructured um, the whole social work group, I mean, I should say program, um, they put me into another program, which I didn't want to move to another program. Not that I had anything against them. It's just that that's not where I wanted to be. I wanted to continue to stay with my fellow social workers that I've been working with for nine years almost. And so that was very difficult. And um, also at the same time, I noticed how much I love providing groups and I wanted to do that full time as opposed to just it being a small portion of my time. Because that's what it was at the VA. I did many things. That was one of the many things that I did was running groups. Right. So you you say that what you do now is coaching. How is that different from therapy? What what are the differences? Um, why are you considering yourself now more of a coach? Are you a life coach or, but let's do one question at a time. So what's the difference yes. between coaching and therapy? Yeah. So I call myself empower, an empowerment coach, just, just to let you know, that's what I consider myself right now. But the way I practice coaching different from therapy is that as a uh, therapist, which I'm not providing therapy right now, but as a therapist, I see clients with more who are struggling with more severe mood issues or relationship issues. Whereas in as a coach, I see clients that are further along in their journey. So therefore, as a therapist, um, I would work longer with a client. As a coach, my program is three months, even though I provide weekly support uh, for a whole year, but the program itself is three months. And and what's the difference between the two, coaching and therapy? Right, right, exactly that. Because the ther- therapy, you go deep into the past, so it takes longer. Whereas with coaching, it you, I don't go deep. In, of course, the past is brought up and we discuss it, but we don't stay focused on the past. We po- fo- stay focused on the present and the future. And so as a therapist, I, you know, with that, I can provide, and I do need to provide a diagnosis for my client as a coach, I do not provide a a diagnosis. And so most of my coaching clients, they either have had their therapy already, or they have their therapy on the side, or they don't need therapy. And they're already, they're a bit more um, uh, further along in their journey versus somebody who's starting therapy. I hope that makes sense. Well, sort of. Um, still trying to to understand sure. some of it. As sure. I kind of understand coaching, coaching is more. You are 
asking questions and trying to guide a person to more self-discovery, whereas yes. therapy is a lot more, you have to deal with self-discovery, but you're, you're really trying to come up with a diagnosis, why things are the way they are. Yes. That, and also dig deep into how is it, where did this diagnosis come from? Where, what was, you know, as a social worker, I am uh, trained to be holistic. So what happened in your childhood? What happened in your school? What happened? What, what's happening with the government today that is causing you mental health issues? So it's not just social work teaches us not to just be focused on a diagnosis, but look at the big picture and look at also the person's strengths and how is it that they have survived other, other problems before and how do we draw from those, um, those strengths and so all of that, yes, everything that you said, and more. <laughs> and more. So how did you come up with the name Power to the Self? Oh, I am a big, uh, I have, well, how, how should I say this? I have, I have affection for the phrase power to the people. I really like that phrase because I think it really speaks to standing up against um, people who have power over us who are outside of us and have power over us. So power to the people, I really like that phrase. And so power to the self is about standing up to the fear that's running the show on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so you came up with this, this name and how do you use that or where does that fit into what you do? Yes. Yeah, so the, the program that I have created now for, for, power to the self. It's called empowerment for you. That's number four and letter U. And basically each segment, each of the U, which I'm going to say briefly, if I may, something about um, is based on the groups that I had already developed uh, for my clients before. So it's kind of like I've taken the highlights of those groups and put them together and made a three-month program. So the first U is unlearn the lies that you were told about you. Um, in this case, you know, if, if you had an abusive ex or an ex that kept telling you things about you that were not true, such as you're not worthy, you are crazy, you're not good enough, you are not attractive enough, you're not smart enough, all those things are lies that we need to identify and um, challenge. And sometimes these lies might have come originally from a parent or a boss or a higher ranking person in the military. Uh, so it's not necessarily just a partner, but it maybe over the years, somebody, you know, some of us have heard those um, through words or actions of our loved ones um, in that way. So anyway, we focus on that and focus on tools as to how to um, unlearn these lies. And then the second U is uncover the difference between healthy and unhealthy relationship. This is where we talk about healthy boundaries versus unhealthy boundaries. What do they look like? Um, what are our rights in a relationship and um, what does healthy versus unhealthy relationship look like? So we discuss a lot of those during that segment. And then the third you is um, untie, untie yourself from shame and guilt and move towards self-compassion. And this is where we talk about what is shame? Where does it come from? How does it grow bigger? We make it bigger without even meaning to do that. And how do we move towards self-compassion? Because we cannot be in shame and self-compassion at the same time. And uh, so we learn how to, how to be more aware of which one do we go to in each moment. And uh, Brené Brown calls shame the master emotion. She and others have called it master emotion. And it's such a perfect way to describe shame because it's so uh, such a uh, strong experience and it affects us in such, such deep ways that we really need to address it. And then the fourth you is upgrade your vision for your future. And um, that's where we talk about like everybody will come up with their own vision for their future. And we, we use the triangle that I mentioned earlier to do exercises to help the client uh, match their thoughts, their behaviors, and their feelings with the vision that they have in their mind so that they can move toward that vision as opposed to staying stuck in one place. So that, that's the for Empowerment For You program. As a, as a therapist, when you are talking with people, when they come in and start working with you, do you pretty much 
fairly quickly form some basic expectations of what you think will happen um, and how to proceed with people? As a therapist, uh, we always, as a therapist with the client, we come up with goals together. So we discuss it together. I don't necessarily tell the client, so here's the goal, let's go for it. I don't do that. I mean, I don't think any therapist would do that. Yeah, and, I, and I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking yeah. more of in your own mind. Do you, oh. do you draw some conclusions? Not, not that you tell people, but uh -huh. do you kind of draw some conclusions? And what I was really getting to yeah. was, it just popped into my head to ask this, have you begun working with people thought you had a pretty good handle on a situation and then suddenly you were totally surprised by something that caused you to need to shift and maybe look at it in a different light which is not a bad thing but i'm just curious yeah. if you've experienced no it that. does happen it does happen i can't think of any particular case right now but it does happen as therapists sometimes we come across situations that's a first timer for us and so that's when we, it's so important to get consultation from other therapists. So that's very common where we go to our, you know, fellow therapists and colleagues and, and say, this is a situation and I'm stuck here. I, I thought that I was going the right way, but I don't think that I am. What, are, what is your feedback? Because it's always helpful to get the perspective of somebody else outside of us. They, we, we all have blind spots sometimes. And so in those situations, it's very common practice to get consultation from other therapists. Yeah. And of course, that gets back to talking, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And I wasn't in any way thinking that you would tell somebody something that you, you just drew a conclusion. And so this is the way we're going to proceed. Uh, I know that therapy is all about exploration, but it just seems like from time to time, we all are looking at something that is going on or that we're involved with. And suddenly something happens that causes us to, oh, we have to really change that. Yes. Yes. I mean, you were talking about like aha moments, like I got yes. it, maybe I need to go a different way. Yes. Right. I'm sorry that I didn't get it uh, before, but yes, that happens too, where uh, suddenly something clicks and you might change direction as a therapist. Yes. That happens too. Yeah. People are very complex and are very surprising, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. the way we are. Yes, we all are. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it is something that we all face. Tell me um, more about the Empowerment for You program. And specifically, what I'm wondering is, do you uh, do a lot of things virtually or just in person? Or how does all that work? Yes, it's all online. Uh, because I started this program during the pandemic, of course, you know, I thought that, and here's the other thing, working as a coach, uh, the way it's different from a therapist, as a therapist, I can only provide services to women or people in California, whereas as a coach, because I don't dig deep into the past, and I don't do therapy with them, I can work women from anywhere in the world. And that's what I love about it. So to answer your question, everything is online. And for example, right now I have a client from Germany and another one in Canada. And, and the beauty of online community is that, you know, we can, we can help so many people. Okay. So yeah. the question that comes up is, have you had any from Iran? I had requests. Yes, I had requests, but for different reasons, it didn't work out because what I do is um, I provide a half hour free consultation for everybody. So everybody uh -huh. can always just sign up for a half hour consultation because I want to make sure that we're a good match. I don't want sure. to just bring everybody into the group because it doesn't serve them or the other group members if they're not a good match. They need to have enough in common to uh, be able to benefit from this group. So I've had uh, a couple of clients, but not clients, but people who were interested and uh, they were from Iran, from in Iran. Uh, and um, that didn't work out for different reasons. But yes, they were interested. Have you at all been back to Iran since you left? Yes, I have been back three times. And the last time was 2012, December. Of, in fact, the last time I left was 12, 12, 2012. <laughs> I, I picked that date. I thought it'd be a fun day Cute. to leave, but uh, that was the last time I, I went there. Yes. It's been 10 years now almost. Did you have any concerns about going back or was it a, was it an issue? Uh, no, no, not at all. I mean, people with certain backgrounds might have, you know, concerns, but I, I didn't. I didn't, you know, if they have had connections with the previous government or, 
if they're in the US military, I mean, those individuals would be scared to go back and understandably so. Sure. But I didn't have anything uh, to be concerned about. But since you had left there, I was just kind of curious if that created a stigma of any sort regarding you. Didn't bother anyone. Back in, back home? Going back home, yeah. Oh, no, no, not at all. No, no, because I, many people, like everybody is trying to leave Iran right now. So mm-hmm. if you mean like a stigma, meaning judgment by Iranians inside Iran, if that's what you mean. Or, or the government. Oh, the government? No, they don't care. They okay. really don't care. As long as, as long as you're not, you haven't, let's say, if you're not involved with American government in a military type of way, let's say, or um, they're very sensitive to people who have traveled to Israel for, you know, because of political reasons. They would be concerned about that. Yes. So, you know, so there's some things that they're very sensitive about. And also if you have had connections with the previous government, if you worked for the previous government in a very like, let's say military position, those, Mm -hmm. those people probably would be concerned to go back. But it's great that you're able to go back and and visit family and so on. Are your parents still alive or are they still Uh, there? My father died many, many years ago. My mom moved here to the U S so she's here and lives close by. But I have lots of cousins, not lots, but some cousins in Iran. I have some family in Iran, and I would love to go back again one day soon. And aside from the fact that there's so much, I love nature, and Iran has beautiful nature, different type of nature. I would love to go back and see the nature and history and the sites. There's so many historical sites that I haven't seen, only seen pictures of, that I would love to go see in person. Needless to say, I guess. I've never been, and it would be interesting to visit that part of the world. Yes, um, my, you would like my, it. My wife is is in a wheelchair, and I'm not sure how much wheelchair access there would be. So that might be yeah. something that keeps us from going, because it wouldn't be fun yeah. to go there yeah. and not be able to share it. But um, yeah. as a speaker, yeah. I've had a, an opportunity to travel a bunch of places she hasn't gone. So that happens. Yes. Yes. I I mean, I, I would, if I were to guess, um, in terms of... Um, um, access to certain buildings or resources, it's probably not, uh, they're not as advanced as the US. So that can mm-hmm. be a problem. Yeah, that yes, would be well, and there are a lot of places in the world that still have a long way to go and laws regarding persons with disabilities are still way behind the times even here. We're not nearly as forward looking as we ought to be. Hence, we tend not to be included in so many things. It's unfortunate, but true. Very, very unfortunate. Yes. Yes. I'm but you know, we, we do live with it. Well, what do you do when you're not working? Oh, when I'm not working. Does that ever happen that you're not working? Oh God, yes. <laughs> I make sure that that happens. Although last year I went a little overboard with working too much, but this year I'm doing much better. I love to take pictures with my cell phone and to edit them and just to put them on my personal page. That's like one hobby. I love to travel. We just came back from Mammoth. It was gorgeous out there. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, yeah, spending time with family, with friends. Cool. Those are some things that I enjoy. And now mom lives close by, so she keeps an eye on daughter. Yes. Moms are supposed to do that. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) one of my like favorite part of the week is uh, we go there every Wednesday for dinner, my husband and I. So that's a really good tradition that we have set up since a few years back. So every Wednesday we go over there. Um, I love that. Yeah. Well, that's kind of cool. Yes. Yes. And of course she gives us back so much food to bring home. And um, it's like, mom, we we have a, we, we have food, but she doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, Well, (laughs) You know, um, again, that's what moms do. Yes. Yeah. They're supposed to. It's a rule. You didn't know that. Yes. <laughs> he does that. I mean, Our, I, I can see, I, I always appreciate and take the food that she makes, but she also gives us fruits and vegetables. And I'm like, mom, we have, we go to the grocery store. Are, are you a mom yet? No, I'm, I'm not a mom. See, you don't know the rule. No. <laughs> I only know it from a daughter's perspective. There you are. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. better to be. Well, I don't know whether it's better to be on the receiving end than the giving end because <laughs> both are good. But 
it's a rule. Moms, moms are yes. supposed to do that. And daughters are supposed to uh, accept it, although they can complain too. It's okay. Yeah, I don't, it's okay. I'll take it. <laughs> well, tell me if people want to reach out to you and um, explore being um, a, a client or working with you in some way, or if they just want to learn more about you, how do they do that? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, my website is powertotheself.com power to the self.com. And I am on Instagram almost every day. You can search power to the self on Instagram and you will find me. And I um, offer half hour free consultation for any woman who has experienced an unhealthy relationship that has affected her self-esteem. So feel free to set up a time and see if we're a good fit to work together. Do you do anything on Facebook or LinkedIn? At all? I am on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not that active, but I am on, on LinkedIn. Recently, I, I updated my profile there because I hadn't been there for many years. And but I'm not on Facebook. Only I have a Facebook account only to do my uh, Facebook group for my clients. I provide mm. um, support on the side. So um, I do have a Facebook group for my clients, but that's it. I don't post anything there publicly. I only ask because Instagram tends to be a lot less accessible since it's a lot more photo oriented than is Facebook or, or more important, LinkedIn. Um, so yes. I'm glad you're on LinkedIn. That makes it possible yes, for people to find for sure. How do, how do they find you on LinkedIn? What do they search for? Uh, it's, uh, I, I should know this. I think it's my name, Homer Afegihi. Yes, it's my name. Can you spell please? Sure. A first name, H-O-M-E-Y-R-A. Last name, F like Frank. A-G-H-I-H-I. So best thing is for people to go find you at powertotheself.com, though. I would say yes. They don't have to remember the spelling of my difficult <laughs> That's name. easier, yeah. <laughs> powertotheself.com would be the best way to, to find me, yes. Well, I hope people will reach out. Um, it sounds like what you're doing is extremely important, and um, I believe it is, and I'm glad that you're able to really help provide some perspective for so many women, especially, but I think all of us, um, I think there are lessons that we can all learn from your experiences and the way you've been able to approach life. And you've been pretty brave at doing some things and taking risks. Like I said before, there's nothing wrong with taking risks and finding things that worked and finding things that didn't work and then going elsewhere. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Michael. Yes. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I am so happy to be here and you, you, I'm sure all your audience would agree that you, Im, you embody empowerment. So it is such an honor to be in your presence and to, to have had this hour with you. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's, it's my pleasure to do it. I forgot to ask, have you written any books? Not yet, but hopefully well, soon. There. <laughs> there you go. Yes. See, there's a, a new project and having a podcast. Yes, it's See? coming, hopefully. I haven't actually sat down to to think about it, but the, the thought is in my head. It's in that stage right now. <laughs> in some ways, it's a lot easier to do a podcast than to apply for and get a job doing radio. And it's a lot of fun. And you get to set up the rules for what you do with a podcast. And it's, it is very rewarding. You get to meet some interesting people, depending on how you set it up. So I hope you'll do it and let us know thank about you. it. Yes, for sure. And thank you again for it. it I enjoy being a guest and especially here. It was so fun. Thank you for asking so many interesting questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you for, for being here and for visiting with all of us and for all of you out there, please go visit www.powertotheself.com. And of course, we hope that you will, wherever you're listening to us, give us a five-star rating here on Unstoppable Mindset and tell your friends about us. We would appreciate it if you'd let them know we exist and encourage them to listen and give us five-star ratings as well, because your ratings really matter. And I appreciate seeing what all of you say. If you want to reach out to me directly, my email address is Michael H I M I C H A E L H I at accessibe, A C C E S S I B E dot com. You can also visit www.michaelhinkson.com slash podcast, and Michael Hinkson is M I C H A E L H I N G S O N 
com slash podcast. And again, would appreciate those ratings. Want definitely to hear from you. And Homera, once again, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you. Our pleasure.